Hi everybody, welcome to the BNB Connection. This is episode five or six, Brad. I can't remember. Is it six? <laughs> six. Episode six. And we decided to do this on tempo. Now, this is our like third or fourth time recording this because we had issues with Camtasia, so uh, now we're using ScreenFlow. So hopefully this works this time around. All right, so first of all, uh, Bradley, explain what tempo training is and give an example. Yeah, tempo training is varying the tempo uh, that the cadence that you lift at. So the classic way that it's often discussed is in four numbers. The first number would be the eccentric. The second number would be the whole the time you spend in the neutral position. Uh, then the third number would be the concentric, and the last number would be the time you spend in the neutral position top of the concentric. So, for instance, if it was 3010, it would be a three-second negative, no seconds in the neutral position, no isometric hold, one second on the concentric, and then no seconds again in the isometric portion. Um, and this is a standard way that uh, we've been, that you'll see in textbooks as well as in many magazines is looking at tempo. So let me further elaborate on that because Brad was making up his own language there, saying neutral position. He means the isometric position. So um, say I'm doing a military press, okay? I If I'm doing tempo training and it is, what's the example used? 4020? 3010, yeah, 4020, whatever. 4020. Uh, so say I'm starting up top, I would go 1, 2, 3, 4, 0 seconds here, 1, 2, zero and then go right back down so you could have an unlimited combination here say you did two one two one you would go one two one one two one just like that so you see these in articles tempo recommendations um, where various experts will tell you what tempo to use now uh, just to give kind of a refresher the first time I ever heard about tempo training was from Charles Poliquin. I, so I, I'm going to credit him for popularizing it because I never heard of it before him. Um, some of our friends, Bradley, some of our good colleagues use this. Joe Dowdell likes tempo training. Um, and then there are other experts like uh, Christian Thibodeau and Chad Waterbury. They always say lift as explosively as possible. Um, before we get into the research, do you use tempo training? Uh, have you used, well, first of all, how long did you own a gym for 18 years? 18 years, yeah. 18 years you owned a gym. As a trainer, did you I do a lot of... I seven way, so that's why I'm so, I look so young. <laughs> you started when you were six years old. I was that's 10, awesome. I was 10 actually. So. <laughs> um, so did you, as a trainer, did you do a lot of tempo training? I have experimented with it a little, but over time I have gravitated towards not using it. And my personal approach, and this is based, this is evidence-based, based not only on what we know Don't of the research. Don't talk about the research yet. Just talk about what you did. So, good. I, I'm, I'm getting there. The research is, <laughs> <laughs> the research at this point is very equivocal and not well done. We, we can get into the specifics, but also on a lot of personal experience. So, my general approach at this point is to perform repetitions quickly and uh, that really depends as it always does my favorite phrase in fitness is it depends but if you are a strength or power uh, athlete your goal should be to move explosively like you had mentioned that Chad Waterbury and some others uh, describe uh, because that's the goal of the sport. What's that, Christian Thibodeau? Uh, that is the uh, goal of the the actual sport or, or the activity, where you're looking to move something heavily, even in strength. So if your goal is strength, you're going to try to move the weight explosively. It's going to move very slowly by nature. If you're performing a one, two, three RM, you're not going to be able to move that weight very quickly. It's going to go up at a two second or even more, uh, two, three, four. If you're really doing a true one RM, I could take four seconds to complete that, but you're not in intentionally it has to do with the intent so you're not intentionally slowing it down from a bodybuilding perspective my focus is more on the control of the lift so 
looking at it from a time perspective to me is, is really irrelevant. But what I try to uh, have the competitor do or the, the individual who's looking for hypertrophy do is to focus on the feel of the weight and, and really focus on the mind to muscle connection. So if you're coming up, you, you focus on just squeezing. And if that takes a second or two seconds, it's really kind of irrelevant. I think it's probably a one to two second positive contraction. Uh, and eccentric is roughly the same thing. So you're talking anywhere from two to four seconds total rep and no, uh, no isometric hold on the neutral in the neutral positions. Neutral this? As opposed to this or this? No. Neutral meaning not going concentric or eccentric. Um, yeah, you're making up terminology here. Quit being a guru. Um, okay, so uh, I have a bone to pick there. I bet you, you mentioned one or two seconds. I bet you if you went to gyms around the world and you really looked at the tempo, most people do a one-second concentric and a one-second eccentric. And they do, you know, a repetition takes two seconds. I would say worldwide, that's probably the norm. Do you agree? You know, you probably. I don't think it matters. Again, the t exact time, how long it takes doesn't matter. If When you're focusing on that squeeze, it, it has to do with getting mo really a mind-to-muscle connection. So part of it is how long the repetition is. Uh, you get a shorter repetition in something like a curl than you're going to do in a lat pull-down. To me, the timing is irrelevant. You know if I'm feeling that weight, how long did that take? I mean, I'm coming down, feeling my muscle. What was that? Second, second and a half? So, it's not relevant well, what the actual time is. The That's reason why point. I wanted to bring that up is because if people are really doing one second up, one second down, and, and we're telling them to do four seconds down and two seconds up, we're telling them to lower it four times slower than they're used to and a lift two times slower than they're used to. Essentially yeah. the, the, the whole entire rep would be would take three times as long. So we're telling them, they're doing two seconds. Who's we? Are you telling them that they should be doing a two at four and two? No, I'm not. Good point. <laughs> well, okay. So, so what I will say is, is that most people who are training for hypertrophy are not, do not get a good mind to muscle connection and that is a big issue with why a lot of people don't get their optimal results that a lot of people just focus on swinging up the weights and they're not really feeling the muscle work as much as they should be. Agreed. So that to me is much more the issue than focusing on, if you're focusing on the time, then you're not focusing on the muscle. So it's just not the way you should be going about it if your goal is hypertrophy. Like I said, from a powerlifting or strength standpoint, the focus should be on moving the weight quickly. That there, the time is much more relevant. It should be an explosive, when I say quickly, explosively. That's an explosive lift because that's what the goal of the, the movement is. So talk about the research. What does research have to say about this topic? Yeah, so the research is very equivocal. I mean, there are studies. It's really all over the place. And it really comes down to the flaws in, in the methodologies used. It's, it's hard to design studies uh, in this context. Um, it also has to do with the modalities that are used. The majority of it is done on isokinetic uh, machinery, uh, like an isokinetic dynamometer, which controls the speed of repetition. But that does not necessarily equate to what we call isotonic movement using free weights or cables. Uh, they, they're not necessarily correlated in terms of how they apply, because on an isokinetic dynamometer, you are getting a resistance when you're moving. It's, it's forcing you into a, a given speed, whereas in uh, the isotonic type movements, your movement is controlled by is going to be dictated by gravity. And so let me let me elaborate on that a little bit. So I yeah. used a, a di isokinetic dynamometer when I was in Auckland, and I, I love them. They're great, but um, you can use them for testing and for training. Um, so like, say I was doing elbow flexion, and I'm in this dynamometer. I can control the speed, so it's going to have constant tension on your you know, arm coming up and down. You can control the speed and you're pushing as hard as you can. So, well, I wouldn't say constant tension. It's a constant speed, but you're putting as much force as you can against it or as much torque as possible um, throughout that speed. And again, you can use it for testing people and so you can show that they did this training and then they improved their rate of torque development or their torque production at this speed or whatever. Or you can use it for training. But the problem is, 
like less than 1% of, you know, like our listeners, probably none of our listeners will have access to a dynamometer. So this is special, this is kind of like research for researchers. It doesn't, it's not very meaningful for our field. So the, the, the problem with most of the research you're saying is that a lot of it is on isokinetic dynamometers and not as much research on barbell, like isoinertial training. But there are studies on isoinertial training, and what do they, if you had to summarize it, what would you say? I'd summarize they're conflicting, uh, that some show, because again, a lot depends upon how you design a study. So, I mean, there's a classic study by uh, Tanamoto where they equated, they did a three-second up and three second down versus a traditional one in one cadence uh, and found similar results from muscle hypertrophy and strength measures. But they, the weight was at a different level and its sample sizes are small. So there, you just get different, there, there's differences in the, uh, some results show some better results with slower training, some results show better results with faster training. For the most part, if you're looking for speed, for power, uh, the literature pretty much does show that faster training does promote better results for the most part. Um, although even that, there's some conflicting aspects of research, again, just in, in the flaws in research design. Okay, so um, I will now discuss how I use it in my training. Um, and I'll just talk a little bit about tempo, just offer some, some random thoughts. So I never, in my, the way I work out and the way I train clients, I never will tell them, like, you know, I'll never give them instructions on the concentric or the eccentric. I will have them pause a lot. I do a lot of pause reps um, and isometric holds. So, like, when they do hip thrusts, the hardest part is at the top. So I will have them, I want them to, you know, make sure they're using full range of motion and a lot of times on the last rep of their last set, I have them hold it to, for five to ten seconds because that's the hardest part. It builds good habits. It also, it, it's a great way to induce metabolic stress. You get a big burn holding it there. So, and they would have just stopped the set there, but I make them hold it there at the top. So it's a way to extend the set. Um, now, the way I think of tempo though, I don't, I personally think that that can interfere with the productivity of the set. If you're trying to count, you know, you have a self-selected cadence that's going to give you the best results. And when you start veering from that and start focusing on counting rather than the lifting, I think that you can interfere a little bit. Now, that doesn't mean I just always lift as explosively as possible. It depends on the goal. I'm not trying to do seated rows as, as fast as possible. I'm trying to squeeze the peak contraction, the end range, you know. When I do seated rows, you know, you want to come and squeeze and hold hold that position for a second before returning. So it's not about being as fast as possible. So it, some exercises have increasing strength curves, like squats. You're weak at the bottom and you're stronger at the top. You could also say they have descending torque angle curves. So with a squat, you explode up, but the top range of the movement is light. So some studies have shown that when you do explode, when you do lift as fast as possible with submaximal weight, what happens is you have this burst of muscle activation, you spring the weight up, and then about halfway through the lift, you start decelerating because, you know, otherwise if you didn't, you'd be curling like this and it would like drill you, you know, or like you'd squat and you'd leave the ground and you'd have these jarring forces. So in that situation, I think of it more as instead of like dynamic, you could say dynamic effort and con compensatory acceleration training is the same thing, but really they're different um, to me. With dynamic effort, you're trying to move as fast as humanly possible. With compensatory acceleration training, you're just kind of, yeah, to me that implies a more smooth, you try to lift more explosively as the weight gets easier in things like squats and deadlifts, so you're just ex you know, like compensating for the mechanical advantage by lifting more explosively. However, you can also use accommodating resistance, so bands and chains. My problem with bands is, and chains is that most people use too heavy of weight with bands and chains. And I think it's best when you use just enough to let you keep accelerating that weight for longer so muscle activation stays high and doesn't shut down. 
Um, and in most of the studies on band, the, first of all, there's tons of research on bands and chains. And they show, almost all the studies show um, favorable results in comparison to traditional training, which could be because it's novel, but I don't think so. I think there is an advantage. But most of the studies use only like, you know, say 10% of one rep max for band and chain ten tension. It do they don't go too heavy. So I like bands and chains for that, but it also it, what boils down to it all depends on the lift. Say I'm doing deadlifts, I think you should pull explosively, but but if you're doing dynamic effort with 50% of your one rep max, you'll find that you burst up and you could like, so you try to squeeze the glutes and I don't know, it's hard to explain, but you can you can do explosive deadlifts in a way that's not jarring by like pushing your hips forward. With squats, I don't want to leave the ground. You know, I don't want to keep accelerating to the point where I jump off the ground. You accelerate and then you kind of slow it down at the end. Um, you know, like chin-ups, uh, trying to think of exercise, like rowing movements, I try to squeeze the end range. Curls, you try to squeeze the end. Tricep extension, squeeze the end. You know what See, I mean? Squeezing the, hold on, let me just, squeezing the end, because I'm a big fan of that. That does not necessarily – you. for me, I'm not holding that for a second. Squeezing the end, I'm squeezing the end and then coming – I mean, it's feel, when you're feeling yeah, the yeah. muscle throughout, you're squeezing. You're basically squeezing throughout the entire movement, but that end gets a little right. extra, I guess, because it's in an isometric um, uh, isometric uh, component at that point where, where you're at yeah, a place where it's – It's a split second. But you're, you're, right. to, to talk about it as, as a tempo, I think really that's the issue with me is that that's – where it's not like all right one okay now I'm coming in right, it's right. just it's a feat and yeah, then yeah. it's a bodybuilder now you're talking about hypertrophy yeah totally so agree about, it's a hypertrophy thing so it's not it's not about tempo now again I think that's where the misnomer for me comes in that we shouldn't be counting these things it's about the when it comes to hypertrophy yeah. it's about the feel when it comes to training uh, for power and strength it's about explosiveness and I'll, well I'll tell you another thing when you uh, when, when you tell a client to pause for a full second, they won't. If you tell them to pause for three seconds, they'll pause for one second. If you tell them to pause for five, they'll pause for three. Because what they do is they start counting before they've locked out. So, like, I've always thought if I really want them to pause for three full seconds, because three full seconds is this, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, that's a long pause. And they won't do that. If you tell them pause for three seconds, they'll really pause for one and if you tell them pause for five, they'll really pause for three. So I, I adjust for that. But you're right. When it's just the feel, you don't even hold it for a full second. It's just reaching end range and kind of squeezing. That's not affecting tempo too much. But it's not lift as... Because to me, if you lift as fast as humanly possible, then every set of bench press, you would you jar up top. Every set of squats... Well, but, no, 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 but see, this is the thing. If you, yeah, but you'd only be doing that if, let's say, you're a strength athlete. The weight that you're going to use, you're not moving it that quick. So if you're a strength athlete, you're training with five reps generally and below, five RM, four RM, three RM. There's no way you're going to jar yourself because by the time you're you're getting up, it's going to be a slow rep. Even at, let's say your five rep. How fast do you move in a five rep? Uh, your first rep on a five rep uh, max. You're still moving it. It may be. Yeah. A second so, and a half. I mean, it's not. You're not so able to I, I see your point, but I okay. Picture push-ups. If you really were exploding as fast as possible in a push-up, you'd do a plyometric push-up. Do a push-up. Yeah. But you can do explosive push-ups by kind of like coming down, reverse it very fast, be very explosive when you reverse it, and then you kind of chill, coast to the top a little bit. You don't leave the ground. That gives a very good stretch shortening cycle, so it's good for athletics, but you don't have to be jarring. If you want to... Why not do the plyometric? If you want to do plyometric push-ups, you do those separately. But Why? one study showed that, because one study showed that you get more, uh, I think it was Izquierda or something. We reviewed it, Brad, in our, I think we did in our push-up article for SCJ, but you got more uh, force. And I don't know if they measured force or impulse or rate of force development, but they had when you didn't leave the ground. So I started practicing with that, and I saw when you when you leave the ground, you have a slower, and then you end up exploding towards the top. But if you just do a very fast cadence push-up, you end up 
the reversal is quicker and you produce more ground reaction forces. Anyway, I could be wrong about that. I, I think I remember okay. that right. Remember that study, but okay. Um, well, considering I did most of that paper and you just rode my coattails. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> That's uh, so wrong. That would be just if that was the case. So. I, I don't think I could have any. I've teamed up with you with almost every paper I've published because you do, you make them fifty times better. Um, anyway, uh, so um, anyway, but the point is, um, I'm never in my training or when I train, I'm never counting the eccentric or the concentric. Do you think that it could interfere with the results by counting? You're focusing on something other than the, you know. Like well, that's what right, exactly. So I, I think that really the issue with this is is that the from a hypertrophy perspective, as I said before, it comes down to feel. And certainly, if you're counting, you're not. It's going to interfere with your thought. And from a strength and power, you have to be focused on moving the weight, not about if you're focused on counting. Again, it's going to diminish. I, I could never see focusing on, on really maximizing my strength or power where I'm counting at or up. I, I just don't do it. Now, I have experimented, with, especially with some beginner clients early on in my career. I just didn't find, again, I, I think it took away from their focus of form in that context. Really, that's where I had thought the application might be in, in some of the newer clients who are just trying to focus on the form and you're getting, okay, think about the smoothness rather than... And it just didn't work well. It didn't. I, I gravitated yep. towards a more natural approach where they're focusing on the weight, the form, whatever it is. Yep. Okay. Two more topics we should discuss. Um, one is the speed of the eccentric contraction. Now, if you look at all the research, I would say that um, the body of evidence in in terms of what's more important for muscle growth if you had to choose one, the concentric phase or the eccentric phase. If you could only do concentrics or eccentrics the rest of your life, I would choose eccentrics based on the you research. You either or, uh, like if you're on a beach and you only could have Brad, one. Brad, you can only do one exercise the rest of your life. What would it be? Uh, no. So, um, <laughs> it's got to be the hip thrust. <laughs> um, so uh, the eccentric component, would you agree that if you look at the – I know, I know – a lot of times the the like the studies aren't work matched and things like that or volume equated but when you do the the differences aren't as big but the eccentric is every bit as important as the concentric phase if not more would you agree yeah at the very least it's as important and uh, there's actually been a, a recent meta analysis that showed there actually was a slight advantage how much of it is due to uh, a difference in in work matched uh, in the work that's done is equivocal. But yeah, I, I would completely agree. And by the way, there's also differential, you get different responses between concentric and eccentric. Yep. So they actually produce different aspects of yeah. hypertrophy. Just they, work the, through, the yeah, they, they work through different mechanisms. So, um, so the, so we both agree that the eccentric phase is very important. Now, here's what's interesting about eccentric contractions. When you do a concentric contraction, the faster the velocity, the less force I can produce. So the slower, if I'm isometric and I'm pushing as hard as I can, I can produce the most force. As I go faster, and then, you know, when I go real fast, I can produce less force because that's, um, you know, that's, that's you know, in concordance with the force velocity curve. But eccentric contractions are different. With eccentric contractions, the faster you go, the more force you can produce. So the graph kind of looks like this, with concentric being slower, but e but eccentric being faster, if that makes any sense. So this side, with concentric, the faster you go, the more force that you can produce. So does this mean that we should be producing fast eccentric, we should, we should be doing fast eccentrics or slow eccentrics? And if I do do a fast eccentric, like say I'm doing a barbell curl and I go down very fast, how do you know if the muscles are doing the work or if you're just letting gravity do a lot of it? Yeah, and that's the real interesting thing that, um, so number one, you, you described the force velocity curve well, and there has been I know. some good evidence showing that, um, that when you move faster, it actually has greater effects on the hypertrophic response uh, and on strength 
now again some limitations of that research specifically that the bulk of that research that I've seen is all on using isokinetic I think it might be one or two that's using isotonic but it's virtually all using the isokinetic dynamometer isokinetic machinery which again does not necessarily as mentioned does not necessarily translate to uh, isotonic training uh, whether the tension on the muscle there might be other factors uh, I do think the most important thing, again, is the control aspect. I don't think you need to lower a weight like this. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I think that's probably a negative for the most part. But uh, Unintended. If, if you just do it very quickly. The muscle is not doing any of the work at that point. You're not lowering. The muscle needs to be forced to lower the weight. And if you're not allowing the muscle to lower the weight, whether that's a second, two seconds, and by the way, the other issue with some of the research is they've studied the extreme ranges. So they've studied a very fast versus a very slow. And they haven't looked at what about an intermediate slow. So this is where you have to start to try to piece together things, use some logic. Um, and again, to me, I, I don't think the time is nearly as important as just making that muscle do the work. Now... So you and I both agree that you don't need to do super slow eccentrics, but I have used that in my own training and with clients before. For example, with the bench press, I don't load it up to 130% like studies show you're 30% stronger with eccentrics, but I will load it up to say a one rep max. So they are going to do their one rep max. I will lift it off for them, say the bench press. I have them lower it very slowly. I don't count. I just tell them to lower it slowly. And then I'll maybe have them do three reps with their one rep max, lowering it under control. And I've found that to work well for if, if you haven't done it and you do that for your bench, you can see some, some extra gains. You know, if you, that's if you have a spotter, a competent spotter, I should add. But you believe there's a time and, the play, and place for things like that? I do. I mean... I, I think it's something that... Um, didn't you that write an article on that? You wrote an article on that in the SCJ, right? Yeah, well, I, I didn't discuss the tempo as much, but yeah, I, I do. Uh, you, you need to allow, you, you need to um, make the muscle do the work. Now, how slow, I actually have experimented. That actually is an area where I've exper experimented, not necessarily with the tempo. But like you said, just making them lower it slowly. Whether that is more effective or less effective... I, I've not seen any research on uh, super maximal negatives as, as far as the timing of them goes. Yeah, so we can speculate. Theor and, but, theoretically, you could load up to 130% and just have them. They would lower it a lot slower, but try, they're trying to resist. As, but correct. That's what, for athletes, kind of get that stimulus when they do plyometrics and things like that. You get this high force eccentric loading when you catch an Olympic lift or when you, you know, um, but... Uh, and a final point I'd make on that, which again is you wouldn't get this from research, but sometimes just doing, we kind of mentioned this with a variety aspect, just doing different things that the uh, that hit works the muscle in a different manner can facilitate greater gains. Sure. Tapping into other mechanisms. Okay, we got a couple minutes left. Last topic, super slow training. So there's, sl <laughs> there's slowing it down and then there's super slow training, which... I, um, if I recall correctly, that's a 10 second concentric repetition and a five second negative repetition. Now, uh, this, there's a, a, some, some of the younger listeners won't know this, but super slow, when did the book super slow come out? Like nineties? It was in the early nineties. Early nineties. Yeah, and there are still a lot of proponents for super slow training. And I, I, someone the other day, um, Dan Ogborn posted something on Twitter. If you want to get blasted, just talk about tempo and watch the super slow people come after you. So, as Lane Norton would say, "Come at me, bros." Um, I bring it on, guys. Yeah, I, I will say that super we'll, slow. We'll training. post this to the super slow uh, forums and, and look at the hate mail that we get. <laughs> but their argument would be that. Well, first of all, they would say that research supports it, in which case I disagree. They would cite the article you talked about, but that had flawed methodology because it, it looked at a slower tempo outcome. But uh, well, I let me explain that. That's an important thing. We can't just gloss over that. So the 
what the super soul people hang their hat on was a 1995 study by Wayne Westcott. It was actually a combination of two studies he did where he did a, uh, a two, uh, 2040, kind of the Nautilus protocol, uh, so six second uh, rep versus a 15 second rep. So 10 seconds up, five seconds down. And what he did was is that he then tested them. He tested the six second group on a six second, two second, four second down. I think it was a 10 rep max. And he tested the um, super slow on a five rep doing it at, at very slow reps. Now, what is the issue with that? Well, anyone knows that if you're used to doing something, as most people you don't are, have as much to, gains to get out of it. So if you do, so they're, they're uncoordinated. The beginning right. when you have to lift something very slowly, it's an uncoordinated thing because you're not used to do. It. It's something you're that gonna you're just. A, you're going to be incredibly weak. You do some training, and you'll get way better at it. So the margin will be a lot bi bigger, right? So they they would say that there is that research does support it. But if you read the entire body of research, and I've over the years I've come across lots of articles comparing faster versus slower, slower tempo, and I would say faster, up to a point, faster has an advantage with strength, hypertrophy, power, and even me me metabolic responses as well. Would you agree? Well, well, that's with super slow training, it's across the board. That Really, the only study that I have seen, and I think there's been one other that, I don't think it was published, that it was a poster uh, study that gave support to super slow, the fact it wasn't published would say something. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's been actually multiple studies that have come out for strength, for power, for hypertrophy. Schwenke just did, looked at one for both strength and hypertrophy. Uh, and metabolic, that's correct, that the uh, faster repetitions, the traditional burns more, use, utilizes more energy. Uh, so really, it's, it's a no-brainer. No and, and what's the other thing, the logical fallacy, Superslow says that, well, you're going to reduce momentum when you're lifting. Well... If you're just looking at that, there's been a study that shows that after two seconds, beyond two seconds, there is no additional benefit to slowing down as far as momentum yeah, goes. Yeah, like quasi-static. Yeah, is 98% right. I have studies with that too. Um, so one last point, and then we got to go because we're at 32 minutes, I think. Um, the, a lot of the super slow people would say tr for training the elderly, this is important because they don't need jarring on their joints. But I think you and I would both agree that the elderly, they lose power. They, they, they lose power and functional strength. So give them, there's no reason why they can't do box squats and RDLs with a broomstick if you have to. And then slowly add weight. But you can give them glute bridges and function, like exercises that are going to build their hip extensors and build their, keep their quad mass and keep their function and power so you don't need to purposely slow it down for that group there's ways to have joint friendly training that is still more functional and transfers more to their activities of daily life do you agree uh, yes and I'll give you one uh, recent study just done looked at one second up three seconds so basically an explosive concentric three seconds down versus three seconds up three seconds down in the elderly showed much greater functional improvements after I believe it was eight or twelve weeks uh, in uh, 65 plus year old subjects uh, with no issues as far, no differences in injuries between groups so that it did not have any negative outcome measures. Awesome. So, okay, so to summarize tempo, um, depends on the exercise. Some trainers have employed it. Some of our friends have employed it with success. I personally am not a big fan of it. I think it can interfere. Uh, so are you, uh, but we do believe that you should try to focus on the feel and make sure you're feeling the muscle. If you're training for hypertrophy, for athletes, you should explode. You should use different types of exercises and drills, for example, heavy lifts, and the intent should be to move it as fast as possible, even if it's slow. That, that was by research by Sale and, and Beam, classic research by Sale and Beam that shows that it's the intent. You might not move fast, but it's the intent to move explosively that makes that ensures that you're firing your that you're recruiting all your motor units and um, so and utilize heavy lifting explosive lifting plyometrics things like that to make sure you're you know developing your power and rate of force production and your stretch shortening cycle and all that and what else uh, don't do super slow training <laughs> do you agree I agree anything else to add 
Well, and just that I certainly, I know you are too, we're both open towards changing our opinions if evidence comes out. And certainly, like I said, the research, because of certain limitations, makes it difficult. But just from a logical perspective, it's hard to see why, why or how uh, counting your reps and, and focusing on a given time really is going to have significant benefits. So I'm certainly open. Hopefully that, that research will come out and we can do another podcast. Okay, thank you very much for watching. Um, we are going to conclude now. If you, we, we like to see reader comments and uh, or listener comments, and we also uh, are open to. We we always just we never know what we're going to do until Brad comes up with an idea two days before we we record these. And so, if you've got ideas, we'd like to hear them. Thank you very much.